Welcome everybody to the EPRC podcast. We have here Dr. Julieta Galante of Cambridge and Melbourne Universities, and we're going to talk about the EPRC. Well, thank you, Daniel, for inviting me for the podcast. It's great to be here with you. And we're at the ISCR inaugural annual conference 2023 here at UCSD. Thanks to everybody on the um, ISCR team. Uh, done a remarkable job with this conference. It's been really good. Yeah, we're really enjoying it, particularly the networking and uh, yeah, just meeting new people, getting to see in person uh, people from the EPRC for the first time. Yeah. Yeah, it's been really good. So tell me something of your journey and how you ended up here involved in researching all of these things. Oh, that's a very... Uh, <laughs> uh, do you have time? <laughs> sure. Okay, good. Um, my journey, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just very passionate about this topic. I just love working, uh, researching uh, meditation and... Uh, the effects of meditation, the, the, the nuances around it, and, and contemplative practices more in general. Um, I guess it all started with me being a young medical student, uh, being a little bit stressed and finding yoga and meditation useful for managing it. Um, and I think I, I found a bit more than that, I found that um, the uh, particularly yoga would suggest um, they would have a different framework for understanding medicine that was totally different from the one I was learning and so I was fascinating um, fascinated by by the fact that different cultures could come up with alternative physiologies and alternative way of seeing and understanding and getting to know the body um, so so I think also I was very interested in mental health I was always interested in that and and in, in research and in science, so everything got combined. After I finished my, my medical studies, I studied public health. I was always wanting to, to do good, good science, uh, try to um, generate um, research that would, that would be reliable, that actually we could, we could all trust the results. That was always very important for me. So I combined that with my interest in, in meditation. I was always um, conscious that it was good for me, but also conscious that um, it, it's an end of one, as we would say. It's just me. So it may not be that it's useful for everyone. I was always um, quite careful not to, you know, um, fall into that um, idea that if it's good for me, it's good for everyone. Um, so I really wanted to bring together this idea of good quality research and, and research into new, new things and, and, um, and open up the frontiers of, of science. Uh, perhaps the other aspect I would need to mention is that I also had some challenging experiences with, with meditation. Um, very, very nice, very, very interesting, but also um, unsettling. Um, and because I was being trained in, in biomedical mental health and, and, and treatment, um, there were things there that were, were, weren't making sense. Uh, how different frameworks would interpret some experiences and, and whether these would be, um, uh, you know, shall I, shall I just, uh, you know, keep in mind they were unsettling or shall I uh, stick to the fact that they were pleasant? Uh, what, what, what shall I do with those? So, um, yeah, so I was always interested in that as well. It's just that it's very, it has been so far harder to do I mean it's already hard to do meditation research and to get funding for meditation research it's even harder to get funding for um, researching these these uh, experiences that are more unexpected and and the consequences and and all the um, the nuance around them so meditation research so far has been very focused on um, health and well-being on the on the positive end of the spectrum and and um, for many reasons, the whatever else was happening and whatever nuance was happening was 
uh, being overlooked and treated almost as, as a bit of a taboo for, for many reasons, yeah. Yeah, and you also got a PhD in loving kindness, is that right? Yeah, so when I finished my uh, public health uh, training, um, I was trying to find um, scholarships or jobs or opportunities to, to, to do some meditation research. But I, I thought it was a bit of a lost cause. I was in Argentina and uh, I was quite confident that nobody would fund, uh, fund me to do any meditation research there or anywhere for that matter. So, um, but I still had people around me who were, um, I think, um, key people who, who cheered me and stimulated me to, to look for opportunities at least try. And so I found, I found this scholarship for a PhD where I studied loving kindness meditation in the UK. Uh, very unusual, yeah. Yeah, and so MD, PhD, public health degree, a lot of training in science, in methods, in rigorous research, and recognizing a really profound discrepancy between the mainstream clinical understanding of the deep end of what you were experiencing for yourself and other people you knew were experiencing some of these things and the models just didn't line up, yeah. right? And so then yeah. you were kind of... And it's funny you mentioned other people I knew because actually I didn't know other people who were experiencing similar things. Well, initially... In each, for quite a few years, I didn't. And uh, this was... I'm old enough that this was before... Uh, any forums online and anything that would mention this. So uh, it's not like I, the internet was there. I, I'm not that old, but uh, <laughs> but there weren't, any, there wasn't, I couldn't find any information that would help me to understand that. And it wasn't, it wasn't that, it wasn't bad. It wasn't something severe that was, I was still functioning and everything was fine. But there was a, my, my curiosity was tremendous and I, I couldn't share that with anyone also. Uh, and then what happened? Who'd you meet? What'd you find? Well, then after several years, I, um, well, with a PhD, with a loving kindness meditation PhD, I discovered this practice and uh, that helped me a lot. That was exactly the sort of practice I needed at that time, I think. And also I discovered Buddhism because basically my, my practice had been mostly with yoga uh, and, and that sort of um, techniques and frameworks and a little bit of Zen and, and other things but um, I, I hadn't really um, sort of uh, understood or read much about Buddhism and, and the richness of the text that related to meditation and the, 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 the instructions and the descriptions that some Buddhist um, texts have so uh, that was a discovery, and yeah, and then progressively I, I, I came across descriptions that were quite close to the things I had been experiencing. Um, but it's all very muddled, it's all very mixed with uh, ontological frameworks of um, uh, ideas, beliefs, like wh why, how to interpret those experiences. It's all so uh, confusing, and it's... Um, it's just uh, very, very hard to make sense of everything. For someone like me, who is like agnostic and very skeptical of things, and I, I appreciate the experiences, and I'm open to them, and I'm open to, to, to things in general, but I'm also very reluctant to sort of um, attribute an interpretation of, you know, anything around this is reality more than this other thing. Uh, I just, there's no way I can, yeah, convince myself of that, like, um, so it's, it's a bit of an odd position to, to be all the time um, uh, having to accept uncertainty around all of these things, and at the same time trying to um, think of ways in which we could apply modern research methods and understand a little bit more without falling into, um, as much as possible, into interpretations uh, about reality and how this links to consciousness or um, I don't even think that you necessarily enter higher consciousness what's higher consciousness I I understand it's altered consciousness states perhaps but then all these about higher lower uh, closer to reality further away from reality all these aspects I think are uh, 
yeah, they, they, they include ontological frameworks that I'm reluctant to accept fully, yeah. And that also don't scale globally, so... Yeah, exactly. Right. They're and culturally so, dependent, right? And so if the goal is to figure out how to help people everywhere, right, to have the justice and equity component, mm -hmm. then that, your idea about staying out of the, the conflicts about ontologies, about what truly is, um, and, and I, this is the thing we share, right, both being MDs, that clinical perspective yeah. where we don't need to know what the white wiggly lines of migraine patient is seeing are. We just need to know that's a migraine, yeah, exactly. right? And so, so that very practical perspective that allows yeah. you to scale something that just helps people and relate to these things. And also to go back slightly, to be fair to the Vedantic and yogic traditions, they actually do have some pretty extensive maps if you can find them. If you can find them, which, right. yeah, And yeah, if exactly. you can make sense of them. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, and the same is true also of Buddhism, where the way a lot of these traditions came to the West and other countries is that, you know, some of the, because of some colonial and secular things, a lot of the stranger aspects kind of got stripped out or, you know, the, and that also um, eliminated a lot of potentially very helpful and normalizing map technology, right? So, yeah. and then figuring out how to bring the best of that back in in a scientific way has been the quest and the challenge. Yeah, and yeah, in the, in the yoga um, tradition, I think I did find um, descriptions that were matching what I was experiencing, but there was nothing in, well, I couldn't find, and perhaps I just, I'm pretty sure I didn't have also the right sort of guidance and teachers and, and people around, but um, couldn't find like, okay, and, and, and what, what do I do with this? And, and how does this relate to my modern life? You know, I'm not yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, a yogi like a, a thousand years ago in, in India. Like, you know, it's just, everything is so different. Uh, so I really think um, we, we need some, some extra effort um, in order to guide modern practitioners and help them um, be supported and, and I was lucky I mean many people have experiences that are much more unsettling and and uh, impairing than than the, my experiences so um, yes we really need to do a lot of work in this area and so then the EPRC is the thing that hopefully will be a part of that work do you want to tell a little bit of your origin you're part of the origin story of the EPRC and yeah. um, you want to talk something about that? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, after sort of discovering that there, there were some sort of, that, that could be, could, we could draw inspirations from, from traditional texts in Buddhism, but also from other traditions, I thought that we could put together a think tank. So we could, we could put together a collaboration between researchers, um, contemplatives and clinicians that could um, at least start to design the, the, the studies that we would need to sort of come up with the, the hypotheses based on what we already know from the traditions and then design some studies to test those hypotheses. Um, so I was thinking of putting together this collaboration. I got in touch with many people who were already starting to work in the field, such as yourself and Andrea. Um, Andrea Grabovac. Yes, exactly. Um, and other people as well. So, so we tried to put together this think tank. Um, we failed with uh, funding applications, but we said, and you said, actually, let's do it anyway. Um, so I guess that was the origin. And when you said that, and then you had more free time in your hands and, and, and lots of ideas and... Uh, so that's how the, the whole thing got started, I guess, right? And then you invited me to spend the summer at Cambridge. Yeah, and that's where we thought, well, basically that's where uh, I think we realized that the amount of work that was needed was huge, yep. right? Uh, and then I think that, that's where you started uh, delineating the actual steps that we needed for, for a foundation and, and, you know, all of that, that is a lot of work, just the admin, just the paperwork, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, 
Yeah, um, when you invited me there and I was spending the summer there, also a whole bunch of people were like, hey, Daniel, what are you doing with your summer? And I was like, I'm hanging out with Dr. Julieta Galante at Cambridge University, trying to figure out how to be the change we want to see in the world. And they were like, well, that's totally cool. And these people also happen to be practitioners. They'd had a bunch of these experiences. They recognized the profound deficiencies in the mainstream scientific and clinical understandings of them. And they also happen to be neuroscientists and you know, clinicians and happen to be at places like Harvard and eventually Yale and Oxford and Brown and Vanderbilt and MIT and lots of other exquisite universities that just don't have quite such fancy names like Melbourne and Monash and um, you know, Vancouver and lots of other wonderful places. And so we realized, wait a second, we've got quite the collection of horsepower here, right? There's an amazing amount of capacity to, to actually change things because these were people who are at the universities and at the, you know, in the positions that can actually do that. And so that was really inspiring when we recognized um, the, the power that was inherent in this ever expanding group. Yeah. And also the message sort of recruited for itself like people were like, well, of course, the clinical mainstream is suboptimal about these things. Of course, we have some capacity to make a real difference. And yeah, it might take a long time. Yeah. And yeah. so and cost a whole lot of money. But let's do it. Yeah. And the effort itself also is very complex because it has to be interdisciplinary by nature. Mm -hmm. um, and so we all probably have, you know, different roles, different um, uh, things to contribute. And, and it's always harder and also very, very rich, but, but harder to coordinate all those efforts. So some of us are, are more scientists, some of us are uh, more on the side of contemplative uh, leaders, some are more like writers or artists or uh, professional people who are supporting uh, in, in, in the, all, the, all the things that need to happen for the research to happen. Yep. Um, we have lawyers, we, accountants. Exactly, exactly. MBAs. Um, organizational experts. Um, computational linguists, venture capitalists. Yeah, yeah. A lot of AI and machine learning people who can exactly. apply really cool cutting edge technologies to data yeah. analysis. And then also clinicians and clinicians yep. from different uh, clinical traditions. Uh, yeah. quite different from each other in many cases. And the, I think this is important because uh, they may use uh, different ontologies and they may have different ideas. I, I, I find that we, we really don't share the ontological frameworks, the personal ones. But the important thing here is that they see a lot of patients that have emergent experiences. Right. They they have a, a, a knowledge of what's out there, what 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 sort of uh, patterns uh, people come up with when they experience these things, and that knowledge is also very useful for for research. Otherwise, researchers are blind. We we may be researching things that are not relevant for the people out there. So we yep. we need that collaboration as well. Absolutely, and to figure out how to scale it and integrate it and across cultures and languages and various, uh, the needs of different professional groups that are going to be relating to this yeah, yeah. and relate to this. So yeah, that's, and it's been amazing to see the thing grow. Like it's taken on a life of its own that's way bigger than any of us that helped start it. And uh, so, yeah. Yes. Um, do you want to talk about some of the specific research that you're working on? Yeah, well, um, uh, yeah, there's a lots of things. <laughs> But um, perhaps one that comes to my mind right now is related to this collaboration, and it's a bottom-up approach. We're setting up a consultation um, with uh, uh, meditation teachers of the traditions that have informed mindfulness um, interventions and also teachers of, of mindfulness interventions themselves. Um, and we are, uh, we, the, the idea is to ask them what do they think is progress, how do they realize, how do they notice when someone is making progress in meditation, uh, or uh, different ways of asking this, right? What uh, We're trying to devise actually what, what are the ways, the words that we need to use to ask these things. Uh, perhaps instead of progress we should use the word change. How do you know that someone is changing and how, or, or development, how do you know that there has been a development in their practice. Um, 
So at the moment we're in very early stages of this, but the idea is to see whether there is um, what different traditions think that progress means and how they assess it, what benchmarks, what markers of progress they see among their students or, or, or of any development they see among their students, um, and whether there's any consensus. So whether um, there are some things in common that, that teachers see, there are things that are specific to different traditions or perhaps different teachers within the traditions. Uh, so to have a, a bit of a landscape of how teachers see these. And then uh, once we have this, um, we think that it will help us to understand what to measure when we want to measure people who are meditating regularly. What do we need to look out for? That, pe that teachers look out for? And does it correspond? Do the, do the experiences and, the, and the, the, um, the appraisals that the practitioners themselves have about their practice coincide with what the teachers expect? Are they different? Are there any patterns that are new? Or this sort of very, um, I think it's laying the groundwork, like it's, uh, it's basic and, and perhaps it's a little bit obvious in some ways, but we think that if we don't have these sort of common language and and and, and explicit um, make make the ideas explicit and the assumptions explicit, we we cannot start doing. We need to we need that to build up uh, the work. So yeah, this is what we're doing. We're trying to work at that very basic level, bottom up, bottom up level, rather than us imposing what we think. Going back to um, what what's happening in the ground with teachers, with clinicians, with the people who are there, like working with the people. Nice. And do you have any future research projects that you want to be working on? Yeah, well, this same idea can be extended um, and it can be made uh, more focused. So uh, a sort of a similar consultation can happen with specific, for instance, uh, maps of meditation progress. So we can focus on on teachers who are relying on a specific map uh, to ask them, you know, what is the contemporary view of that map? Because these maps many times, well, almost uh, every time they come from very cryptic, very ancient texts that were written for people in their time with a different language, with a lot of uh, ontological assumptions around it. And so we would like to know how teachers use these um, maps nowadays, how they talk about them, and what, how they sort of diagnose where people are in those maps. And for that, we need more focused work. And those things are harder to fund. And um, so we're not doing that sort of work yet, but we would, we would love to start doing it uh, at some point. Yeah, we're, we're now doing more general things, but this is really the sort of work that we would love to do with the EPRC, more focused. Nice, and you're actually with a, a team at Melbourne University. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, uh, the we have a new. University of Melbourne, right? So, yeah, yeah, we have a new contemplative studies center, and uh, we were very lucky that uh, we we got a, a gift from from a philanthropist that allows us to to work for at least uh, five years on on very uh, questions that are all around these things. Um, so we're building, putting together a really nice team, very interdisciplinary team of researchers. Um, and yeah, we're starting to get this work done. But um, yeah, as you said, it's, it's a lot of work. It, it's a long-term project. So we will need more support, clearly. Yeah. That's true. Nice. Anything else you would like to say about people who are interested in the EPRC and what we're doing? Um, yeah, basically, uh, just come and talk to us. Uh, I think um, anything, even, even if people have concerns or people have questions or uh, curious about things. I think, um, yeah, um, we're very friendly, right? That's true. It is yeah. an amazing bunch. That's one of the, the, the incredible things about this group. It's nearly 200 people now, and they're super nice, cool, interesting, fun, talented, capable, motivated people. Mm -hmm. So it's been delightful to be a part of this ever-expanding group. And it will take a whole lot more. It's going to take a lot of resources to get this done. You know, big systems change of high inertia systems is obviously a tall ask. Yeah. And so, but I think uh, if anybody can do it, the EPRC can. Yes. Great. Nice. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you so much for this time and uh, for all the work you've done to make this project possible. All the work you've done and you are doing. Yes, thank <laughs> all you. All of us. Yeah, yeah. All right. Bye. Bye.